You may be seated. I was told years ago when I first started out that, am I okay here? That the three hardest things to do was to climb a wall leaning towards you, to kiss a girl leaning away from you, or to pack a church building out on a Monday night. Forty years ago, when I came to Bakersfield, I'd, I'd been here three years before seminary and started church on the south side of town, and uh, I didn't think I would ever come back. Uh, nothing against Bakersfield, but I didn't think I'd come back. <laughs> and uh, the First Baptist Church of Oildale, which became Valley, called me, and I was struggling with that. And I went up on the bluffs one night, and I was looking at the lights of the oil field and of Oildale, and uh, I made a promise. I said, Lord, I'll come if you'll give me men to serve with, godly men. And when I drove up tonight and I saw so many pickup trucks in the parking lot, <laughs> I thought God has answered my prayers. I know there's hundreds of men here from our church, but I, I'm amazed how many people from other churches and from influencers. It's become a wonderful partnership between uh, Valley and influencers, and I am so grateful for you being here tonight, and I'm honored. Thank you. God bless you. Now, I want us to open our Bibles together to the book of 2 Timothy chapter 4. 2 Timothy chapter 4. Tonight the message is unusual. It's unusual for me in that uh, when I think of a sermon, I think of speaking verse by verse of what a text says, and uh, phrase by phrase even, and the pastor interprets it, and explains it, and then applies it. We call that expository preaching, and that's what I do probably 99% of the time. But tonight the message is topical. It's a message based upon biblical principle, but it's not exposition. It, it, it's not verse by verse. In fact, the message is not even meant to be so much instructional as it is inspirational. It's not primarily a message for our mind tonight as it is for our heart. I really at this point want to speak to the men of our church and of our community from my heart regarding my experience with terminal illness. I, I want to look at the last words of the Apostle Paul. Last words of an individual are powerful, or they can be powerful. My grandfather, who was a godly man, died of cancer. And I drove across the state. Uh, I was in college at the time to spend the night with him in the hospital. And I, I didn't go to sleep that night because I thought maybe he'll wake up. He'd been incoherent for days. And I thought, I'd love to have one last conversation. And just as the sun was coming up, it was a beautiful morning, and my grandfather loved to hunt. And so I propped him up in bed to give him a drink of water and, and uh, pointed outside and said, what a beautiful day to be hunting, wouldn't it, Grandpa? And he said, yes, and then he said this, but hunting doesn't accomplish much. And he talked to me about priorities of, 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 of life and it was powerful in my life. The context of Paul's last words, he was not in the hospital after having lived a full life and now he's facing death, ready to die and go and be with the Father. Instead, he's in prison in Rome. Not a prison with a television and an exercise yard. It's a, more like a dark, dank dungeon and he's under the sentence of death for preaching the gospel. And so Paul writes a young friend of his, uh, really uh, someone that he had been a mentor to by the name of Timothy. He had invested in him and he said, said this to him. This is in uh, 2 Timothy chapter 4, beginning in verse number 6. He says to him, For I am already being poured out. That's not me. As a, maybe it is me. 
as a drink offering. And if, do we need a different mic? Or what do we need to do here? I don't want a hand mic. Yeah, I'm positive. I've lived too long to start using the hand mic. I don't want one of those Garth Brook mics either. Can you hear me now? Yeah. I think, I think that'll work. Okay. Paul said, for I'm already being poured out as a drink offering, and the time of my departure is at hand. He said, I fought the good fight, I have finished, I have kept the faith, and I've finished the race, and finally there is laid up for me the crown of righteousness, and not for me only, but for all those who have left his appearing. And then he says to Timothy, be diligent to come to me quickly, for Demas has forsaken me, having loved this present world and has departed for Thessalonica, Cretans for Galatia, Titus for Dalmatia, only Luke is with me. Get Mark and bring him with you, for he is useful to me for the ministry. And Tychicus, I have sent to Ephesus, bring the cloak that I left with Carpus at Troas when you come, and the books, especially the parchments. The Apostle Paul was lonely. I believe that. He was cold. He was bored. He wanted books. I think the, the, the books were probably commentaries on uh, Old Testament scripture, one of the parchments, which I think may have been scripture itself. And he wanted Timothy to come and see him one last time. And I understand that desire as you face death. In fact, he says, come quickly. It's our word tachometer. It means uh, with velocity or quickly come. And he says, in fact, uh, come before winter because once winter came to that part of the world with the Aegean Sea, travel was virtually impossible. So he told Timothy, come before winter. And that became nearly a metaphor for don't waste any time. Come now. Make coming a priority. Uh, come before winter speaks of urgency and it speaks of opportunity. Now, when I was a little kid, my mom shopped at a grocery store that gave green stamps. Are any of you old enough to remember green stamps? You got these stamps, depending on how much you spent, and you put them in a book, and, and then you could redeem them and trade them for prizes and that kind of thing, and they had a catalog. And, I always would look through it as a little guy. There was a mini bike I was convinced my mom was going to get. She never did. She'd get a crock pot or something else, you know. I never got the mini bike. But, but you redeemed it. You traded these green stamps for something that you wanted. Paul said in Ephesians 5.16, redeeming the time because the days are evil. And so part of coming before winter is that we're redeeming the time. We're trading it, just like a dollar bill. We, we, we trade a dollar for something that we think has more value than the, to us than the dollar. And it's the same time with a minute or with an hour. We're trading our life away for things that we think have more value than that day or more value than for, for that uh, hour of time or whatever it might be. And so Paul says, come before winter. Come with velocity. Come, it, 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 come quickly, he says. Paul was a Jew. As a young man, he became a Pharisee. That was the strictest sect of Judaism, which meant that Paul was a legalist. He measured his righteousness, his rectitude with God, his salvation, we might say, in terms of keeping religious rules. Late in the spring of his life, though, the Apostle Paul met Jesus on the road to Damascus. And his life was forever changed. And he had this long summer run of ministry where he started church after church all across Asia Minor and even into Europe. And then he had a very productive fall of life. He invested in young men like Timothy and Titus and, and uh, Tychicus and, and, and others. But now, with what we read, he's facing the winter of life. Let me tell you something about the spring of my own life. I grew up in a Christian home. My parents loved the Lord. The church we attended, though, was a very legalistic church. It was filled with wonderful people, but spiritually it was all about rules, or at least that's what it seemed to me. And as a teenager, I rebelled. 
against what? Well, I've rebelled against everything and everyone, against teachers, police, parents, church. I chose a party lifestyle throughout high school. I dealt with a lot of anger because I was small in stature and I got in a lot of fights. Now, I'm not saying I won a lot of fights, but I got in a lot of fights, you know, because I had a chip on my shoulder. And uh, right before my senior year in high school, the district attorney was trying to put me in reform school. That's something that back in those days they did with rebellious teenagers that put you in reform school. And uh, it looks like that's what was gonna happen. So my parents decided they would send me to a youth camp, a Christian youth camp, which I was shocked because it was a Baptist youth camp. And my parents were not very big on Baptists, I can tell you. They, they, were, they were legalist, and that was even a legalism that was way beyond Baptist. Now, I know that's hard to imagine if you're a Baptist, but, <laughs> but it, it's something that actually existed at, back, back then. So, so we go to this camp, and um, we, we stayed in cabins. Uh, each church had a separate cabin, and, and I grew up out in the country, so we had three little churches that went together in a cabin. And on Thursday night of that week, one of the young men got saved, became a Christian. And so that night, we, we had devotions in, in our cabin, just our cabin. Out of thousands of teenagers there, we, we met, and we, we had chairs in a circle outside. And this young man, they asked him to give his testimony, and he talked about how he came to Christ. And then they asked others to give their testimony. And teenagers, there was about 40 of us, I guess, came from our little community. Uh, uh, they, they were getting right with God, and I'm just sitting there amazed by it. And finally, it becomes my turn. They said, okay, Roger, what's your testimony? I go, I don't have a testimony, and I don't want a testimony. Well, there were three Baptist preachers there because there were three little churches, so they kept me up most of the night talking to me about Christ. And I'm ashamed to say, finally, I used a string of profanity like a sailor telling them to leave me alone, and they did. The next day was the last day we were going to be at the camp. It was a Friday. All day long, I ditched every Bible study, just out on my own across the camp, I was thinking about what had been said to me the night before. And I ran into a security guard. He wasn't really a security guard because he's about 80 years old. He was kind of a, <laughs> he's just there making sure people were where they were supposed to be, and I wasn't where I was supposed to be. So, so he talked to me, but he didn't talk to me about breaking any rules, which that's what I was kind of, prepared for, uh, he talked to me about how much God loved me. And he was so tender, and he was so compassionate talking to me about the Lord. And that night, we decided, the 40 of us, we were going to sit together. And, and it was this huge tabernacle with thousands and thousands of teenagers. It's the largest camp in the world. Uh, and, and it was just a huge crowd of people. When the invitation was given that night, Pastor Phil was the first one that went forward. He, uh, in fact, he took off running, and I thought, is he going to stop, you know? And he goes all the way to the front, and I was the last to go forward. In fact, the service was dismissed. I made my way through the crowd. Andre Crouch was singing a new song he'd just written, My Tribute. And I stood right in front of him and looked up as he was singing that song and gave my life fully to Christ. There were 1,500 decisions that night. Pastor Phil was the first, and I was the last, and that began a long summer run of my Christian life. As a teenager, I was able to influence many, many young people for Christ, saw hundreds come to Christ, preached in dozens and dozens of churches, was able to start two different churches during my time. God just richly has blessed my life. And then in the fall of life, we began the transition here at Valley. Pastor Phil and I wanted to streamline our staff. We wanted to remodel our buildings. We wanted to have everything ready for a new pastor. Then last October, I was diagnosed with terminal stage four cancer. The doctor said, if it's untreated, you have less than two months to live. If we treat it, you might have a year, maybe a year and a half. That was last October, so the clock's running. And I realized that winter was coming. And if I get emotional, I want you to, to extend me forgiveness in that because 
the medications just destroyed that part of my brain. I, I, I tend to get emotional now more than I used to. So I want to talk to you about winter, because that's where I'm at. Paul said to Timothy, come before winter. Remember, it's a wetter metaphor for not to waste any opportunities, to set right priorities. Here's the first principle. As Christians, we need to come before winter to the lost. I'm using the word lost as a, as a metaphor for someone who is not a Christian. Jesus said that he came to seek and to save the lost. And so he used it that way, of someone that doesn't know Christ. You see, we, we're not guaranteed another opportunity to come to Christ. Don't wait until your life is consumed with, with regrets and missed opportunities. I, I deal with people like that all the time, that their, their life is just consumed with regrets and and, and, and missed opportunities. Don't, don't wait. Lost is an awful word. Think about this. Lost keys. I mean, that's frustrating. But what about a lost billfold? What about a lost child? If a child is lost, life just stops until you find that little child. And then think about what a, a lost soul. A lost soul. Someone separated from God. We, we can hear sometimes a missionary tell the story about their people group or some nation, how few people are believers, and we can, we can weep over a nation, but can we weep over a neighbor? The reality is this, guys, within blocks of this building tonight, as we're enjoying a time of worship and fellowship and having a good time, there are trembling hands with a needle trying to find an answer to life. And yet you and I, we have the answer if you're a believer. It's Jesus. That's it. There are not any other answers. That's the answer. 61% of the builder generation claim to be Christian. 39% of my generation, baby boomers, claim to be Christian. 15% of millennials claim to be Christians, and that's probably generous. And we're not just talking about the nation. We're talking about our families. We're talking about our friends who are, who are lost. Now, lost doesn't mean that you necessarily you're immoral. You can be lost and be religious. In the New Testament, there was a guy by the name of Matthew of the house of Israel. He was a religious man, but he was a publican. That meant that he was a tax collector, and he was collecting tax for the Romans. They were the occupiers of the land. So he, he was in cahoots with the Romans. He was, like, he was like a traitor. And one day, Jesus stood before him and said, follow me, and he did. And his life was changed. Lost. Lost. It, it means that we're cut off from where we're supposed to be. We're cut off from the plan of God. You see, God desires for us to have a clean conscience. And I'm telling you, men, there is nothing in the world like a clean conscience. We spend so little of our life having a really clean conscience, and there's nothing like it. I mean, you, as men, sometimes we work and we're dirty and filthy, and then you just hose off or shower and you're clean. That's what it's like to come to Christ. You're clean. You have this clean conscience. He gives you joy and peace and forgiveness. But our sin, it separates us from God. The Bible says that we have all sinned. Now, sometimes when we think of sin, we think of, well, that means adultery, a, you know, a pedophile, a terrorist, a murderer. Now, certainly that is sin. But, but it's an archery word. It means to miss the mark, that you shoot the arrow at the at the bullseye and you miss and the bullseye is moral perfection and and that's it guys we, we've all missed it we've all sinned it, it, it's obvious and our sin separates us from god that's why we're alienated from him that's why we live with without purpose sometimes that's why we're so discontent that's why we have a lack of peace in life that's why we have anger deep inside our soul sometimes we don't even know where it comes from it comes from the fact that we're lost we're alienated from god for a believer, Jesus paid the price for our sin on the cross. That's the gospel. That's the good news. There were three men that were hiking up in the mountains, and, and uh, there was, they noticed there was a fire, a wildfire, and it was coming up the, up the hill. They knew there was no way to outrun a fire like that. One man reached in his pockets, pulled out a wad of matches, and lit them and threw them down. The grass caught on fire, and another man said, now we're surrounded by fire. And he says, we just need to get to where the fire's already burned. The fire can't burn what's already burned. That's the cross. The fire of God's judgment burned itself out in Jesus. 
He became the substitute for our sin, taking our place. If we come to Christ, he, he can, not only can, but he will forgive us. And you know what? He'll change our life. It's not just about going to heaven when you die. When I was a teenager, I never even thought about going to heaven. It never even entered my mind. My life was a mess. Drugs, alcohol, a party lifestyle, it was a mess. And I knew that God could change my life. And he did. It's all about God filling your life with purpose and a clean conscience and joy and peace. I'm convinced that if we come to the lost, if you share the gospel with someone, that even though they live a long time after that, you'll probably be the last one that'll ever share the gospel with them. Think how few a times a stranger has ever come up to you and shared the gospel with you. You share the gospel with a friend, they may live 20 more years, they may live 60 more years, but chances are you are the last one that will share the gospel with them. And all of us have family, we have friends, we have neighbors, we have co-workers that do not know Christ. They don't know Jesus. For some of you, it's your mother, it's your dad, it's your brother, it's a close friend. Let me tell you something, winter is coming. You may think you have forever, but you don't. You don't have forever. I was preaching in a church years ago on the East Coast, and a priest, the pastor told me an experience he had had. On, it was on a Thursday afternoon, the phone rang, and someone asked him if he was the pastor, and he said yes. And they said, well, we need your help. Would you come to our home and talk to us? And he said, sure. He went around with their home and met them, and at the door they introduced themselves. And they said, we need help with our son. We think maybe he's into the occult or Satanism or something. And they took the pastor into the boy's room, and there was all the paraphernalia of the cult and literature Satanism. And they said, would you come tomorrow and talk to our son? And he said, I will. The next day was Friday. All day long he thought about it. He knew it was going to be quite an ordeal from what he had seen in this boy's room. He thought, well, I'll study this morning. I'll go in the afternoon. The day got by. He got caught up doing other things, and he thought, well, I'll just go see him tomorrow. He said he could hardly sleep that night because he had broken his word. He had broken a promise that he would see him. He went the next day. He knocked on the door. The mother opened the door, and when she saw who it was, she just began to sob. She fell in his arms around his neck. She pointed to the front yard. There was a big tree like they have back east. And she said, our son hung himself right there last night. The pastor, as he was telling me the story, he'd been driving through the neighborhood, and he stopped. And he said, it was right there, that tree right there. The pastor was a big man. He began to sob and shake. And he said, there was a boy who went to hell from right there, right there. He didn't know winter was coming in the boy's life, but it came. It came. In 1914, there was a train in the station in London, and there were young men gathered by the thousands getting on the train. They were going to the coast to go to Germany to fight the Kaiser. Hundreds of people together, and it was really like a celebration. There was a band playing. These boys were going off to war. No one thought that the war was going to last very long at the time. They thought it was going to be a rout. It'd be over in a few, few days. And they began to shout, and they chanted as they, and they stomped their feet and were, were chanting, give them hell, give them hell, give them hell, boys, give them hell. There was another guy on the platform who had a son that was going not to war, but he was going to Africa to be a missionary. In those days when you went to be a missionary, sometimes because of travel, you didn't ever come back home. Communication was not what it is today. But the, the, the crowd was so large and, and they were so loud, give them hell, give them hell. This boy could not hear his dad, what he was saying to him. Finally, the dad just scooped him up in his arms and whispered in his ear and kept cadence with the crowd. Instead of saying, give them hell, he said, give them Jesus. Give them Jesus. Give them Jesus. Give them Jesus. They have enough hell. They have enough hell. 
Jesus said, I am the way, the truth, and life. There's no way to the Father except through me. There's no other way. This is it, guys. This is it. There's not some other group out there getting people to heaven. It's us. We've got to come to the lost before winter. It's not based on human goodness. It's not based on religious rules. It's not based on trying harder. The only way to God, the only way to forgiveness is through Jesus. We all know someone who desperately needs Jesus. And God put them in your path. They're in your world. They're not in Billy Graham's world. He's gone. They're not in my world. I'll soon be gone. They're in your world. They're in your circle of influence, influencers. Maybe you've been thinking about inviting them to church or to influencers. Maybe they're your one that you wrote their name down that you would pray for them and you would tell them about Christ. Let me tell you something. Winter's coming. It's coming. Do you think last fall when I drove myself to the doctor because I wasn't feeling quite right, that I had any idea that he was going to sit across a desk from me and say, you're terminally ill, and you've got two months to live. I had no idea that winter was coming, but it is. Here's the next principle. As Christians, we need to come before winter to the lonely. Recently, our Surgeon General said something very unique for a doctor to say, strange. He said the United States is facing an epidemic of loneliness. Isn't that a strange thing for a doctor to say? Sociologists differ as to the cause. Some say, well, it's because of the rise of social media. Others say it's the residue of COVID-19. There, there was a wise old preacher that once said, if you preach to the lonely, you'll never lack for a congregation. <laughs> Loneliness has been identified as the number one cause for suicide. In the Old Testament, David was running from Saul. He ended up in the cave of Adullam, and he wrote a psalm while he was hiding in that cave. And he said in the psalm, no man cares for my soul. I wonder how many people in our city could say that. If you walk the streets of any urban city, you'll see lonely people. Even in a crowd of people, there's a sense of isolation. Maybe even here, crowded in this room, there's a sense of loneliness within your life, perhaps. There was a woman in New York City years ago that went on top of one of the expressways, and she had three little stair-step preschool children with her, and one by one, very quickly, she threw them off the bridge. There was the sound of squealing tires and brakes and cars stacking up. But when they were all stopped, all three children were dead. The police rushed to her as they loaded her into the police car. She kept saying over and over. They were asking her, why, 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 why? She kept saying, nobody don't care. Nobody don't care. Our world is filled with people that think that no one cares. And there's not a lot of people that care. That's the honest truth of it. In fact, you may think that no one cares for you. You may think your wife doesn't care anymore. You may think your grown children don't care. But I want you to know that Jesus cares. Jesus cares so much that he's willing to forgive you tonight. And he's willing to absolutely change your life from the inside out. And that's no small thing to forgive you. You say, well, you don't know what I've done. I don't care what you've done. I know what Jesus did. He died for your sin. Every failure, every dark thought, he will forgive. And he'll fill your life full of purpose and meaning if you'll come to him tonight. Our manicured lawns might as well be moats keeping us from one another. Often we think we're too busy to care. And we are busy. We come to church. It's just like tonight. Sometimes we sit shoulder to shoulder with those who are hurting. I guarantee you within just a few feet of where you're seated tonight, there's a man living in pain whose life is torn by grief or maybe their life is being ripped apart by divorce. 
They're facing financial ruin. We've got to care. A church is a community. We develop this Lone Ranger attitude that we don't need one another. And then because of that, we keep falling and we keep failing. Listen to what the wisest man that ever lived said outside of Jesus. And this is Solomon. He said in Ecclesiastes 4, two are better than one because they have a good reward for their labor. For if they fall, one will lift up his companion. But woe to him who is alone when he falls, for he has no one to help him up. We need one another. We need accountability. That's what's beautiful about influencers. It's built on accountability, but churches are built on accountability too. We, we, we're, we're a community of faith. It's so much easier to serve the Lord together. It really is. Her oldest daughter, Charity, was hit by a car and was killed when she was six. It happened when in September that Thanksgiving, all of our extended family got together. And it was the loneliest day of my life. In the midst of a crowd of people that loved me, I felt utterly alone. And you may feel that way. Take it from someone that's living in the winter of life. Please come to Jesus. Allow him to forgive you and to change your life. Our culture is deteriorating. Homelessness has just skyrocketed. Addiction has become epidemic. So here's the next principle. As Christians, we must come before winter to the lowly. We, we, we can see physical needs. We drive past homeless people all the time. We can see physical needs, although sometimes we're blind to them. But all around us, there are people that are, that are spiritually empty inside. Their, their life is wrecked by failure and by, by guilt. Years ago in Chicago, there was a little boy that started attending church on his own, going to Sunday school. He was an obnoxious little guy. I mean, he was a terror. He had all kinds of behavioral problems. Every week, the teacher would send him to the Sunday school superintendent. and He had such behavior problems that finally, in frustration, they said to this little guy, don't ever come back to our church. And he didn't. It wasn't the last time they heard from this boy. It was years later as a young man that there was a body riddled with bullets outside of Chicago theater. And reporters snapped pictures, but it was, they were too gruesome to publish. They published one picture in the Chicago newspaper of his feet. And they could, the caption said, here lies the feet of John Dillinger. What if someone would have guided them in a different direction? There was a Sunday school superintendent that failed that boy. There were Sunday school teachers that failed him. There's a whole church that failed that little guy. They were unwilling to come to the lonely one little boy that was out there on his, uh, on his own. Our city is filled with children that know nothing of Christ. They don't know anything of Christ. No one to bring them to Sunday school. No one to put their arm around them and tell them that Jesus loves them. That's why we keep old church buses running. That's why we have thousands in vacation Bible school. Because let me tell you something. Winter is coming. It's coming. It's coming. Here's one last principle. As Christians, we must come before winter to our loved ones. We must come to the lost to the lonely, the lowly, but to our loved ones. I, I, I grew up in a home where my parents loved me, but we didn't say, I love you. It's a farming community. You just didn't say it. Now, when I married my wife, her family says it all the time. They say it on the phone. They say it in person. If we're together and someone gets up and goes to the bathroom, five people tell them, I love you. You know? My dad was very near the end of his life before he ever told me he loved me. Just about less than two years ago. I was 25 years old before I told my parents that I loved them. Cemeteries are filled every Saturday with people putting flowers on graves of parents and others 
that they never told him they loved him. Herschel Lewis was a rancher in High Hill, Oklahoma. He had a fallen out with his two sons over a cattle deal. And the boys vowed they would never speak to their dad again. He apologized numerous times, but it wasn't enough. He even sent them the money, but it wasn't enough. He wrote letters, but it wasn't enough. They refused to talk to him. They all attended the same little church, but they sat on opposite sides. The pastor tried to reconcile them. The other people tried to help them, but to no avail. Herschel died of a heart attack. His wife said it was from grief. At the funeral, these grown boys begin to wail and sob. And as they passed the casket, one reached in and pulled their daddy's body out of the casket. And they were so brokenhearted to say, Daddy, we're sorry. We're sorry. We're so sorry. We're sorry. But it's too late. Winter had come. Oh, they wished they'd come before winter, but they didn't. Some of you may need to go before winter to a parent. Or maybe your parent's gone. You just, in your heart, have to let go of some stuff. You say, well, they didn't raise me right. They didn't give me the start in life I needed. Why don't you come before winter and push past that and love them anyway? What about your mate? It's easy to start taking each other for granted. I, I've seen couples that are so irritated at one another. They're cross. They're angry. It, it seemed like they didn't care for each other at all. And then one of them dies. And the other one grieves their soul for that death. And yet they never really told them that they love them. Not, not sincerely. Why don't you come before winter to your wife? Or ladies that might be listening before your, to your husband. I don't know how many times I've had the experience as a pastor of a man sitting in my office who took his wife for granted. Now his wife has left, and they didn't see it coming. They absolutely are shocked. And they're so broken, they'll do anything. Oh, I'll do anything to get her back. But winter has come. I want to share with you a story about my own grandparents. I didn't find this out until, until I was grown. My grandfather told me the story as he was dying. My grandmother's family was poor, and they had a large family. And there was, uh, they lived in western Kentucky, in the Appalachians. She was 14 years old, and the family just couldn't, couldn't care for all the kids anymore. So they were going to try to scatter them out. This was the turn of the century. No one wanted to take her in to live with them. None of the relatives seemed to have room for her. So the relatives got together, and they said, the best thing is for May, my grandmother who was 14, is to get married. In those days, they married sometimes that young. And so they arranged for her to marry the man who was my grandfather, who was 23 years old. She was 14. She didn't want to get married. She wanted to live with some of their other relatives. But she, and she resented the fact that the family was forcing her to get married. And she was bitter over it. And she vowed that on the day of her marriage that she would never love him. She would be the wife that she was supposed to be. But she would never say that she loved him. Years went by. I think she grew to love him. and I know he loved her. As a little child, I observed their affection, their love for each other. But I found out on their, his deathbed that she had never told him that she loved him. I, I was in the hospital room once with my grandfather uh, months before he died. And he was a man, a farmer. He just, typical farmer, and didn't express affection. A man I'd never seen cry in my whole life. Days before his death, he said to his wife, why, why, don't, may, why don't you tell me that you love me? I know you do. Why, why, why don't you just say it before I die? Why, why can't you just say it? I love you. Why don't you just tell me that you love me? She was silent. When she died, we had the funeral in the little country Nazarene church where I grew up. I was the only preacher grandson at that time. I have an uncle 
who was a pastor. I'm named after him, Roger Lee. His name's Lee. And so at the funeral, I sat on one side of my grandmother, and my Uncle Lee sat on the other side, the two pa preachers. I was 17, I guess. And when the service was over, it was our job to escort her out. We took her up to the casket. She leaned over the body of my grandfather, and she began to weep and wail. And she spilled tears on his forehead and on his cheek. And she said, oh, how I loved him. Why, why, she said, why did I not tell him that I loved him? Why? My friend, we need to come before winter to our maids and let them know what they mean to us. N not only children to parents and men to their wives, but to your children. Sometimes it's difficult for a man to tell a grown child that you love them. I struggle with that because of how I grew up. Let me tell you something. Cancer cured that. <laughs> Absolutely cured it. <laughs> You'll never be more of a man than when you embrace your grown son, whiskers and all, and say, I'm proud of you and I love you. Why don't you come before winter to your son, your daughter, your grandchildren? There was a man who had two sons. One was mentally challenged. One was a straight A student, an athlete. One day the dad came home and the son that was an athlete was so excited. He said, I, I got news today of a four year scholarship and he's telling his dad all about this. And then the little boy that was mentally challenged keeps interrupting me and he's tugging on his dad's shirt and saying, Daddy, Daddy, Daddy. And finally he's frustrated and he turns and says, Be quiet. And the little boy goes, Daddy, Daddy, I tied my shoes today, Daddy. I tied my shoes. He'd never done that before. And the dad realized how important it was and how proud he was of that little boy tying his shoes. We must move beyond performance-based love and learn to love our families unconditionally. Jesus can do that. He can do that and he will do that. With all four of my children, when they were born, I did the same thing. The first time I held them in my arms, all four of them, I looked at them and I said, there's nothing you can ever do that will make me not love you. You may disappoint me, but there is never going to be a moment in your life that your daddy does not love you. With our daughter who died at six, the first year of her life, I started a church. I was very, very busy. I didn't have a lot of time for her as an infant. I was going day and night, 100 hours a week, seemed like. Her second year, I was building the church. I was preaching in other churches. That, that, that year, I, I preached 12 weeks in other churches, as well as building a brand new church. The third year, I moved to seminary. I left early in the morning for a school, came back at noon for a few minutes, went to a job, came home and studied. I saw her just a few minutes each day. And then I came to Valley, and the church had been declining for some time. I worked day and night to turn it around. And then she was hit by a car and was killed. I had her six years, but not really. Not really. When I look back, I had very little time with her during those six years. I was consumed with things, not bad things, 
My life was consumed with good things. The good can become the enemy of the best. Did you know that? That's the danger for the believer. Are your children and your wife a priority? Do they know that? I was preaching on the East Coast a few years back, and I was riding in the back of a car on 42nd Street in New York City. There were pornographic billboards is the best way to describe them. There were prostitutes walking the street. And I was so grieved. I thought, how could we ever reach this massive city for Jesus? Pulled up at a stop sign, and I heard the name of Jesus. And I was shocked. I rolled down the window, and there was an African-American man, older man with white hair, and he had just a little, a little amplifier with a microphone plugged in it, and he was preaching Jesus. And he's talking about how you have to confess Christ. You have to confess your sin. You have to call upon the name of the Lord. And if you forgive your sin, he'll be your savior. And I, I noticed a couple of policemen, they were laughing at him. And there were some prostitutes that were poking fun at him. But there were some people that were listening. And I rolled down the wind and as we pulled away, I said, God bless you, sir. Because here was a man that knew winter is coming. It's coming. It's very close for me. I don't know if I'm the closest one to death in this room. Likely I am, but perhaps not. Some of you may be living in the winter of life and you don't even know it. You don't know it. Let me tell you, there's enough guys in this room that if we tried to reassemble a year from now, some of you would not be here. That's the raw fact of it, no matter. And you don't even know it. I'm going to invite you tonight to give your life to Christ. We're going to, in a moment, we're going to stand and we're going to sing. And there's guys in white shirts that are going to be available, not only here at the front, but around the building because it's crowded. We're going to have an old fashioned altar call. That is, I'm going to invite you wherever you're standing to come forward or to come to one of these men in a white shirt and just say, I want to give my life to Jesus. They're going to know exactly how to help you. You don't have to know a truckload of theology. You go, well, I, I, just, I just don't know enough. You come with the understanding you have. It'll be enough. It'll be enough. You don't have to be able to explain the doctrine of justification by faith. You don't have to be able to explain the nuances of God's sovereignty and providence. You don't have to be able to explain Calvinism and Arminianism. You don't have to explain. You just have to call on the name of the Lord. That's what the scripture says. All that other stuff comes. But it's not the main thing. The main thing is between you and Jesus. And so I'm going to invite you to come. I'm going to invite you to come and say, I want to give my life to Christ, and someone here will know how to help you in that. I'm going to invite you to come as a believer and say, I want to get serious with God. Let me tell you what will make you serious. A doctor telling you you've got two months to live. It will sober you up. Just like that. Do you think you're going to live forever? Winter's going to come for every one of us. It's just I've already got the diagnosis. But someday you'll get a diagnosis or it'll happen suddenly. And the question will be, have you given your life to Christ? And that'll, that'll be the only thing that'll matter. It won't matter how fancy your pickup is. <laughs> your bank account won't matter. Your stock portfolio won't matter. None of that's gonna matter. It won't matter. The hobbies, your golf score, it's not gonna matter. It won't matter. The only thing will matter 
is have you given your life to Jesus? Is that it? So I'm going to invite you to come and say, I want to give my life to Christ. Or I'm going to invite you as a believer to come and say, I want to rededicate my life. I want to, I, I, I've got some things in my life that I, I need to get right with God. There's men that will pray with you about that. Or maybe you can come to steps like an altar. An altar used to be a place where you offered sacrifice. Now we use the term as a place where you can meet God. You can meet God anywhere, but maybe you want to come and kneel right here at the front. Let me tell you something about my own Christian life. I've lived my life close to the altar. My office, for, for, for many, many years now, 30 plus years, has been right across the way here. There's been many a time where I walk out of that office and I walk into this room and I kneel right here, where I kneel at one of those steps and I do business with God. And that's what I'm inviting you to do tonight. God doesn't love me any more than He loves you. He absolutely loves you. And He wants to change your life. And you may feel like no one cares, but it's a lie. Jesus cares. He's willing to change your life. You may feel like you're lost, alienated from God, but He can change all that in an instant. As a believer, you can come. Maybe you want to come and say, I, I, I need to be baptized. Baptism is the first step of obedience after we're a believer. It demonstrates our faith. And you can be baptized. There's a lot of churches represented here. Or maybe you want to join a church. Maybe you're part of been coming to our church and you want to join our church or join some other church. I don't know. I, I, we just need to be open to what God wants tonight. I heard about a guy that was preaching on hell. And someone said, do you really believe that? That people without Christ are separated from God forever? Yeah. And they said, if I believed that, I would crawl on my hands and knees on broken glass to get one person to come to Christ. Do we believe it? Then let's come before winter. Father, thank you for these men. Thank you, Lord, for your work in our lives. Now, Lord, I pray that we would shut out every voice that might be tugging at our mind right now, except Jesus. And that you would give people grace, just like you did me as a teenage boy. Grace, Lord, undeserved favor. And you would draw people to yourself, Lord. Maybe someone could put their arm around someone else and come with them. Lord, honestly, I don't know what else to say. I let go of this invitation. It's yours. Work beyond what I could say. Beyond what any of us could say. Get down into the mind and the heart of these men. Draw them to yourself. Help us to come before winter to the lost. There's so many people in our lives that don't know Christ. Our world is so jacked up the deterioration of our culture is just heartbreaking. 
And Lord, we can't change that. But we can come to you. We can rescue one at a time. I pray that you'd give us the courage to do that. Draw people to yourself. We pray in the strong name of Jesus. Amen.